Love podcasts, hate nonsense. It's the Politics Joe podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I was looking for the rundown. A very demure clap today. That's the sound of socialist Labour MPs hitting the fucking floor. Yeah. 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 Dropping like flies. You think that's what the Diane Abbott rouse about? She claps too loud. I don't think I've ever seen Diane clap. Maybe she's never felt that anyone deserved a round of applause. Never. She will have clapped. Do you think she'll have clapped at every Labour Party conference? It's like the Anna Wintour smile. You know, when she's like, it's so rare that when Anna Winter actually gives one, it means that someone's done something exceptional. Mm. That's Diane with the clap. The thing is, during every single party conference speech from 2015 to 2019, you know, when they pan to the front bench in the front row of the mm. conference hall, she'll have been fucking going for it, giving it the beans. Do you think? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think we should, I think we should have a look at that. A I think we should do a deep dive. A Diane Abbott clapping compilation. Yeah. I'm not convinced. Aren't you? I reckon she only claps when she means it. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll find out. She's we? not like a fair weather clap. <laughs> she's, a, she's not a cheap clap. No. Oh. Ava Santina, Diane Abbott has the Labour whip restored, but she's been blocked, in her own words, from standing as an MP. So this was actually their plan for the last couple of years. Mm. And I think that it's just become a bit clearer over the the training package that she was offered that has been revealed by Newsnight in December mm. of not last year, the year before. Completed in February. Yes, receipt that it was completed mm. in February. After that, there were discussions where she wanted to, st she wanted to have the whip restored and Labour basically said, yes, you can have the whip back, but you will not stand at the next election and she wouldn't agree to that mm. that's what's going on beneath the surface so they've got exactly what they wanted and if she completed that training module in february mm. and every single labor front bencher prominent spokesperson indeed the labor leader keir starmer has when asked about this situation said there is an ongoing disciplinary process they were lying through their fucking teeth well i think also it'll be interesting to see if they had said that in the chamber i haven't had time to look yet mm. because if they said that in the chamber then does that mean they misled the house well if they if they had done they would but i would be surprised what, what would be the circumstance in which keir starmer was asked about diane abbott in the chamber and spoke about it I could imagine a Sunak jibe about Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott. Mm. Yeah, I think he would just he would ignore it. But you're, you're, I mean, look, over the space of a week, Corbyn's not standing as a Labour MP. Abbott is apparently not going to stand as a Labour MP. And what I found really interesting about uh, Diane watching Newsnight last night is that the the justification given, and obviously it's all allies of Starmer, allies of Abbott, it's all this sort of off the off the record background briefing that's going on, um, saying that it's essentially um, because she's associated with the Corbyn leadership that she gave an interview seven years ago where she performed quite badly and that that was embarrassing for the party. None of these are reasons for, to bar someone from standing as an MP. You know, it, they, they won't mentioned the reason why she was suspended, i.e. the um, the sort of minimising of the discrimination faced by Jews, gypsies, people of the like, comparing it sort of being Irish or ginger. She apologised immediately afterwards. She did the training. The process has been, you can't say she did this horrific thing. She's not allowed to stand the party. And well, clearly, that's not actually a barrier for standing as a Labour candidate because Neil Coyle is standing as a Labour candidate. I was just going to say, I, I couldn't remember if he'd actually been named, but yeah, he has, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, he had been... He drunkenly racially abused a journalist. On the parliamentary estate. Yeah. He's welcome. And the new mayor who took over from Jamie Driscoll in the North East also made a jibe about gypsies. Mm. Um, she is standing. So this is it, isn't it? You can... You can 
she's standing sorry she has got the mayoral when you're asked about it you can say you're a socialist till the cows come home but if you keep kicking actual socialists out of your party welcoming tories with open arms and allowing people like neil coyle to stand again i'm sorry i don't think that statement is worth the paper it's written on how much of this do you think is ideologue driven about rooting out the sort of corbynite or do you think i think it's completely factional yeah do you think it's a fear of of the of the press though and a fear of the opposition a fear of um starmer being described as jeremy corbyn's labor yeah look i think it's um simultaneously pragmatic that it's just electioneering of the sort of most um morally baseless order that you say corbyn lost in 2019 uh it's one of the Tories' favourite attack lines to say, you love Jeremy, la, 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 and you go, fuck this, get him out of the party. Get Diane Abbott out of the party. We're just going to neutralise that attack. Now, do I think for something as cheap as that, to neutralise political attacks from your opponents, you remove the first ever black female MP from your party, an icon, a trailblazer, yes, has made some gaffes in the past, show me a politician that hasn't, and the last leader of your party, someone who you were both both individuals actually you were very happy to serve in shadow cabinet alongside. I think it demonstrates a complete lack of loyalty. I mean, it's not surprising, right? People keep saying, "Oh, but the you know the lies he told during the Labour leadership election, um, you know, the circumstances have changed." How many times can someone show you who they really are, and that person is mendacious? That person is dishonest. How many times can Keir Starmer say to you there's an ongoing process when his chief whip has known since February that the process is finished? How, how many times do you take that person at face value? How many times do you trust that person? Mm. How many times do you let someone hit you in the face before you say, I'm, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start putting my guard up or I'm going to hit you back? What's interesting is when you compare it to the Conservatives, even when someone has made, an MP on the, on the Tory benches has made the most extraordinary gaffe, the leader of the party, no matter you know who that is at the time, will argue that the Conservatives are a broad church, um, and you know they stick they stick by each other. They sort of have that old boys' club mentality to them. The left has always been factional. The left mm. is all the left loves to eat itself, and they cannot accommodate. Um, do you know what? Do you know what I think they're actually fearful of? They're fearful of Diane Abbott being re-elected, and then when Keir Starmer's got this huge majority, whenever he wants to vote anything through, you've got people like Diane Abbott, possibly Kate Osborne, possibly Barry Gardner, who might not vote with him, who might defy the whip. And he doesn't want that. Mm. Can't handle it. It's very ideologue dri driven. I think there is also a degree of um, vengeance. I, th I think they're relishing the opportunity to stick the knife into people like Diane and Jeremy. Do you think? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, think no, definitely I think the Jeremy. labor right, the labor right was and Diane, you know, you, yeah. you look at look at the leaked the leaked emails, right? That they were writing about her during the general election campaign about like setting Michael Crick on her when she goes out to go and get a coffee. Yeah, that's true. You know, you know the these people hate hate the left wing of their party. I'm sure they are deriving a great deal of pleasure from this. Corbyn said something very sad yesterday when he was here that um, Great interview, by the way. Thanks, but he just—he said that a lot of people, a lot of MPs, ignore him. They just pretend he doesn't exist. That was brutal. It was, wasn't Watching it? Watching that, yeah. Should we have a listen? Yeah, let's listen to it. Go on, Laura. You got to go find that now. <laughs> 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 She's writing it down. Look, she's writing it down. <laughs> you could actually see the disdain in her eyes there. She just went. Oh, there's Christ. already a, there's already a cut down. There's already a, there's already an asset. We just drop it on the timeline. It's fine. The attitude of Labour MPs varies between the normal friendly relationship I have with many of them, um, particularly sort of local people, those in socialist campaign groups and so on, and others who um, pretend I don't exist. So it's sort of like you're walking around and like people just walk past you like you're not there. It's like sort of the man who never was. Um, but I don't particularly care. I'm there to represent people. I'm not there for advancement within a particular party. And um, I just think it's quite petty. 
and it is petty, we're there because people lay down their lives to build a democratic society, to get the right to vote, to get the right to free speech and assemble. All those things are under threat. Parliament only exists because of rebellion of people in this country. And uh, we sometimes, maybe all newly elected MPs should be sent on a crash course on British history. Ava, does a, does a, does a solitary tear roll down your cheek listening to Jeremy talk like that? It does, it does give, it, it, it evokes bullying, doesn't it? It does feel it very a, playground. It actually does, yeah. Did you fucking see? Was it, oh, which Johnny was it? Was it Johnny Ashworth or Johnny Reynolds who tweeted like yesterday, I bet this guy got picked on in school. Did you see that? Okay, well, let's, sorry, sorry. You, let's uh, have a bet on that. Can I, can <laughs> oh I yeah, say, go on. That feels Ashworth to me. What do, do you think? think? I'm going to go Reynolds just to okay. keep it interesting. What's just the to wager? Keep it spicy. Oh, whoever, whoever's right gets a coffee from the other one. Let's keep it. Let's keep it low stakes. Yeah. Okay. Well, wait. Sorry. What was the prize? A coffee. A coffee. Yeah. Great. This is a very tense indeed, isn't it? It is. You get like countdown music. I tell you, I'll give you my reasoning for Ashworth while you're looking it up. Yeah. I think Ashworth can go a bit rogue. I think Ashworth sometimes uh, sometimes likes to play the uh, play the main character. Likes to go off piste. Reynolds, I think, um, it's more party line. Reynolds is your safe man. Reynolds is Labour's Grant Shapps. Where the hell? Oh, do you know, I don't think I can feel. I've got it. Here we go. Who was it? Jonathan Ashworth. And it was a quote tweet of Rishi Sunak playing football. And it's, I bet he was always last to get picked at school. That's terrible. <laughs> That's just really mean. <laughs> Do you know, I tweeted something the other week and then I deleted it. I can't remember, but it was on that line. The problem is, right, I don't have your no tweet notifications turned on anymore, so I don't know the things that you delete. You no, but it wasn't, it wasn't so mental. No, no, no. But before, when you deleted them, I would often WhatsApp you and be like, Mm. didn't fancy that one yeah well do you know okay the worst part when I first started this job he had tweet notifications turned on and I would say I was still in kind of like chaotic era so like I would have like quite like I'd go out drink and then I'd just be like tweeting <laughs> and I wouldn't be tweeting anything political I'd be tweeting something like extremely personal <laughs> and he'd be like like in bed reading that like <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> it's too that was too much yeah well look uh, where's Ava this evening oh it's <laughs> one in the morning and she's tweeting and she's tweeting yeah um, okay so I was going to say that sometimes MPs show that they weren't bullied enough at school fucking hell <laughs> <laughs> right yeah because they do something so outlandish something so socially abnormal I go, you needed to be told no by a jury of your peers <laughs> and you haven't been. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I yeah. do know what you're talking about, but I won't, I won't be advocating for bullying, I'm afraid. Well, that's why I got rid of it. I thought actually it's a bit much. What yeah. I was trying to say was, I don't think that these people have been broken down enough to, they haven't been socialized enough. So you were calling for us to bully them? No, I was just making an observation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, yeah. that's why I had to delete the I of, can see why it was deleted. Yeah, because of, you know, bad faith actors like you. <laughs> <laughs> Interpreting it. I in don't that negotiate way. in good faith. Mm. Um, and obviously, this Diane Abbott story is happening. So it's a pretty handy day for the golden boy of the Labour right to be doing the media round today isn't it Ava? I was so confused then that I thought you meant Ed <laughs> thinking, well obviously he is thinking, the golden boy thinking is he what, what is, is he on the right he is <laughs> he's on he is the golden boy no he's he's still in Scotland he's coming back tomorrow he delayed his, tra his train back um, regular listeners of the podcast will be wondering where is Ed is he in Cornwall has he been in Cornwall for the last two days he's not in Cornwall he's in Scotland which is another place so I it's a, it's a, it's an allegory. Surely regular listeners of the podcast know exactly where he is and exactly what he's been doing. They probably follow him on Instagram. If they don't know where he is, then turn it off. Yeah, exactly. Turn off this podcast. Yeah, no, fuck off, you will you? Welcome all, him. All, all of you, fuck off. I yeah. don't even want you to watch. Fuck. So when Losers. will we talk about that then? Will we talk about that when Ed gets back? I think so. Okay. I'm inspired. I've, I've taken inspiration from your deleted tweet and I've decided for the rest of the election, I'm going to bully the audience. Nice. I think that, that will really, it's kind of, it's kind of like when I was 16 years old and read the game and thought that the way that you made women like you was to be mean to them. 
No, did you really? Well, not quite. But you, you read about negging and you're like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Did you ever employ negging? Well, yeah, you try to and then people just stop talking to you because you're a cunt. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not some grand strategy. Okay, so, but there, again, this is what I'm talking about. You were socialised correctly there. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Because there are there are like an asshole puppy. Yeah. There are like 55 year old MPs who every now and again will throw a neg at you, and you'll go, "What? What are you doing?" Yeah. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. You loser. Um. Yeah. They love I mean, yeah. So do, I, so do we start negging the audience? I think so. All right. Nice. Yeah. Let's do the timeline quickly of Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott. Fucking hell, all right. Where, Sorry, we start, just, where are we starting with right that? Right back in. <laughs> this is me bullying them because they don't want to hear this shit. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought was interesting yesterday was Corbyn, I think when he talked about he's been ignored by MPs, when he walks around Parliament, yep. this has been going on since 2020. Hmm. It, you know, the decision was made by the NEC that he would not stand for Labour in 2023. But there's been two conflicting... Um, parts of the Labour Party that haven't quite been running congruently, right? So mm. the Parliamentary Labour Party made a decision he wouldn't stand, but his constituency Labour Party still actually had a mechanism where they could put him up for selection, but they weren't able to. The, the power was taken away from them. Yeah. And this is the Clause 5 that we were talking about yesterday, right? Mm. Not he, on the podcast, by the way. No, oh, <laughs> this, this was in our free time. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to bully the audience. We bully ourselves talking about Clause 5 of the Labour Party. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that bit? Well, sure, yeah. So it's basically the... the um, okay, so New Labour has its Clause 4 moment, right, where it sort of walks back the party by, in its literal charter, its commitment to nationalisation, public ownership, right? And it's viewed as a watershed moment for New Labour, um, essentially sort of casting off its old socialist... Um, aspects, characterizations, and moving forward into a, um, a glittering neoliberal era. And I think somewhat ironically from some factions of, of um, British politics and somewhat seriously, I think, from others, there has been rumor slash discussion about Keir Starmer's Labour Party changed Labour or new new Labour. There's probably some work on the branding to be done there. I think probably get some consultants in to sort that out for them. Brand um, new Labour. Bad new labour. Brand new labour. Yes. Mm. Yes. Spanking new labour. Yeah, maybe not that one. Why not? Because spanking new labour means it sounds like you're beating new labour, doesn't it? If you're spanking them, you're beating them. Well, they are, aren't they? That's what Wes was saying this morning on the broadcast round. He said we're more ready than they were in 97. Hot. Sorry, carry on. So Clause 5 is kind of the commitment to principles of party democracy, like internal democracy, right? Um, and... The way that sort of members of the National Executive Committee are being parachuted into safe seats. I think there's only about 11 left. By the way, if you are looking for sort of the defining resource, the Bible on selections of MPs, follow Michael Crick on Twitter. His account is called Tomorrow's MPs. And it is, um, it's just incredibly useful as a resource. He does a very, very good job of documenting the selections and what's going on. Um, so there's those NEC parachutes. There's the, the just the blocking of people like Diane from being able to stand, uh, who again, it bears repeating, is a fucking icon of British politics, literally. I mean, you had Kwasi Kwarteng last night on Newsnight paying tribute to her. Like she is a, a figure of great import and significance in British political history. She's not allowed to stand. Um, in the case of Corbyn in Islington North, he's not allowed to stand. The party isn't even allowed to choose the Labour representative. So they parachute in this prayerful guy who, if you look at the pics he's posting on Twitter of him canvassing, is one of the saddest things I've ever seen. He has about three people with him. It's almost unfair, isn't it, actually, what they've done to him? Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a stooge, isn't he? I mean, yeah. And presumably he'll get a, a, a safer seat at the next election for eating this horse fucking cart Why do you load. think that they would do that? Why do you think that they would reward him? Because he's eating shit for the party. I don't think they care. I think he's just he's just their useful idiot. Yeah, I mean, that's another interpretation of it. Yeah, actually, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Given by the way that Keir Starmer's Labour Party has conducted itself yeah. so far, I suspect this man will be face down in a ditch and we will never hear from him again he's by the end of the election campaign. Yeah, he will just be alone in a ditch. I don't think there's a ditch. There's a single ditch in Islington North, but he'll find one yeah. and he'll fall into it and that will be the last we ever hear from him. Um, 
it's damning. You look at the photos of him out canvassing and there's literally about three people with him. I'm it's being, not fair. There though. may be four in one of the photos. It's not good. And it's a, a stark contrast with images of the past of Corbyn out campaigning. And I'm sure it will be a very strong contrast with images of him campaigning during this election campaign. Um, so, and that's another instance, right, where they, they, short, they presented a short list of two people, didn't allow um, any sort of meaningful selection process. So the, the constituency Labour Party is fucking fuming and you cannot blame them. Um, so where Streeting was out talking about it and being questioned about this uh, this morning, wasn't he, on the media round? We were actually talking, yeah, so we were talking about Clause 5, weren't we? Because we were saying, what's, why were we talking about that? Um, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. I think we got, I think it was a bit of a segue. But the reason we, the, the, the jumping off point was Wes. Wes was out to talk about private healthcare, but he was being, he was being questioned about Abbott instead. This is, okay, so Islington, this, this Clause 5, so this is what Islington North the constituency Labour Party on the 24th of May, they put out a statement on what you've just said. And they were saying that they learned via London Regional Labour Party post that the CLP's parliamentary candidate had been appointed. This decision was not communicated to members and officers, and they were not given the opportunity to meet the appointed candidate nor to understand what his policy positions are. That's why no one's out campaigning with him because mm. they don't know who he is. Yeah, They've had no association with him. And that's very difficult because the way that Labour it's actually something again sorry that Jeremy was talking about yesterday was that one thing that he is sad that he's had to sacrifice is that while he can while he'll be he can still be the MP potentially he won't be held account held to account by his constituency Labour Party Labour MPs are you know they have to go to regular meetings with their CLP yeah. where they're basically told off or, <laughs> or you know they're told how to accurately reflect the, the, the matters in the constituency. I think we'd say there's an opportunity for constructive feedback, wouldn't we? Yeah. Well, they, you know, they, they sort of say like, okay, well, when next time that you're at Prime Minister's Questions, can you talk about the hospital? Can you talk mm. about this GP surgery? There's a new development over there we don't like or we do like and, mm. you know, yeah. feeding it in. And he won't have access to that anymore, which mm -hmm. he has had access to up until this point. Yeah. And obviously, uh, one of Keir Starmer's 10 pledges when he was running for the Labour leadership was to improve party democracy, internal democracy. So... Well, this is not good for internal democracy because they said the National Labour Party has shown contempt for hardworking and dedicated members who campaigned relentlessly to re-elect Sadiq Khan. Yeah, look, this is it. This is it because, and it's the big argument that you, gets thrown back at you when you say that Keir Starmer, Keir Starmer is a relentless, deliberate, uh, conniving liar, is, well, circumstances have changed. There's been a pandemic. There's been a war in Europe. We can no longer commit to these uh, expensive ideas like nationalising public services and abolishing tuition fees. The thing that tells you who he is are the changes he's made without financial pressure. There is no financial pressure to improve par uh, party internal party democracy in the Labour Party. It, it is entirely within your gift as the leader of the party to go about reforming that. And the fact that he is parachuting these candidates in, blocking long-term um, left-wing MPs from standing... It's, it's, it's clear as day that, 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 that has nothing to do with the pandemic. It has nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. In, it is entirely within his gift and he's, and, he's walk, and he's walking back on it. And it is as clear as an example as you will see of a man who will tell you anything for you to vote for him. Is that not just politicking? Yeah, I'm, yeah, <laughs> fine. Um, Sorry, I'm, is, I'm just playing Keir Advocate. Yeah, please. But, but you know, <laughs> Uh, woe is me for wanting my political leaders to actually fucking stand for something and when they promise me something, deliver it. Would you get over 2019? Yeah. <laughs> fucking move. Yeah. Climb out. Climb out. Uh, yeah. Well, that ship's out. Anyway, uh, we should talk about Wes because uh, he's, well, he said, he said a lot this morning, didn't he? Um, but, but. Brand new Labour. Yeah. Spanking new Labour, was it? Yeah. Brand spanking new Labour. Yeah. He's got a plan to reduce NHS waiting lists. Go on. Listen, boys. If you are a fan of a fully nationalised health service, <laughs> you are not going to like this. <laughs> he wants the NHS to form partnerships with the private sector that go beyond just hospitals. Yes. Do you know what I thought? Do you know what I thought when I read this overnight? I thought to myself, I think we've been paying too little for drugs that we have on the NHS. Really? I think... We need to go full Pfizer, baby. Mm. What about selling NHS data to a firm like 
talent it. Well, I think I think the benefits of that, Ollie, are you know innumerable. Mm. There's so many that I can't improve patient outcomes. Yeah, well, I can't name one. (laughs) (laughs) But but they're they are innumerable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Worth checking out. Where's Streeting's uh, register of interest, ladies and gents? But I'd encourage you. I won't 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 lead you to any conclusions. But it's just worth taking a look. Worth taking a look at who's supporting him, paying for members of staff, making donations, things like that. It is interesting. Now, as reform spokesperson, please, I would just please, I would like to add that when. Uh, Richard Tice first introduced his um, tax relief for private healthcare, you know, providers to get more people using private healthcare who could afford it. When he basically d- just talked about dallying with the private sector, he was, you know, accused of Americanizing the system. He was accused of being a, a Trojan horse for privatizing the NHS. Yes, yeah. yeah, and he was, you know, really getting it in the neck. Fairly. F- well, yes. Let me say that because otherwise they'll think I don't think that. <laughs> um, conversely, when Labour introduce it, it's groundbreaking. It's mm. very clever. Uh, to, to be clear, it is on the reform docket mm. that they would use the private sector to alleviate the waiting list. They they want to use private private healthcare capacity to do that. So there's actually a degree of policy alignment here between the Labour Party and reform. Yeah, which is smart. Look. I, look. <laughs> Well, I suppose they'd both have Neil Coyle now, wouldn't they? <laughs> Birds of a feather. Richard Tice is like, no, we couldn't, we couldn't possibly take Neil Coyle. <laughs> I think, so this is it. This is, um, this is it for me. And, and there, there, has to, there has to be acknowledged, right, on the one hand. Clearly, something is wrong in the NHS. We, we, can't, we, can't, just, we can't just say uh, it needs more money, it needs more money, it needs more money. Because in, in terms of a real terms funding settlement, the funding right now is the highest it's ever been for the NHS as a whole. Uh, patient outcomes in several areas are not as strong or as good as they are in our European counterparts. There has to be some form of conversation about what's happening there. The problem with it is the second you say the word reform in the same sentence as, as NHS, it's like fucking the Facebook mums are like locking and loading shotguns and being like, don't you dare, don't you dare come for our angel nurses. Don't you dare. As we all know, the NHS is high religion in this country. Mm. It's very difficult to have a serious conversation about it. Um, I think, for example, I'm gonna, I've, this is it. This is, I'm going to fucking get this. I told you I'd get you this episode. Someone like Kate Andrews in The Spectator, who... I don't agree with a great deal of what she says. I agree with some of what she says. Every time she talks about this problem in the NHS, it's like, you want to fucking privatise the whole thing? You're a terrible, terrible person. There is a conversation to be had here. I'm not advocating either way on it. But clearly, if you just, if you look at the data, if you look at the problems, if you look at the waiting list, something has to be done about it. Now, if you want to say you are, and you're West Streeting and you say, look, I think the answer is expanded use of the private sector, it's an idea you have to you have to discuss and assess on its merits. Do I think that it constitutes an attempt to uh, privatise by stealth? I don't think it's that stealthy. I think he's being pretty open about it. This is by stealth. <laughs> yeah, he said on Radio Four yeah. this morning. <laughs> um, but look, like the waiting list is significant, and and you have to bring it down somehow. I don't know what the answer is it, it is it is not as simple as saying the nhs needs more money i mean always you could throw you could throw money at that thing um i would advocate that thing. yeah <laughs> shake that thing nhs <laughs> let's just stay on that for one minute about <laughs> sorry no, sorry not on that thing <laughs> oh no let's stay on that thing for a minute mole baby girl so <laughs> privatization by stealth I, yeah. I, you could make a, a coherent argument that I won't make it, but mm. you could, that that's already been happening. Actually, the, the stealth has already been happening with the NHS ever since, well, consultants started being outsourced. PFI, tender for contracts, yeah. Yeah, but ever since sort of like, not e- not even that, I wouldn't even say that was by stealth. I say that was on the, actually the front page of the newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> like the, um, when a nurse or a doctor goes on strike, they bring in these really expensive um, temporary nurses and temporary doctors, mm. and they can charge double, quadruple yeah. what a nurse normally gets as their shifts, salary. Yeah. 
Um, that also happens when there is there are spaces in the rotor and they have to bring in someone last minute. I mean, consultants are charging up to 10 times um, what a normal consultant or contracted consultant would be paid because they can, because they have to have someone there. That to me is privatization by stealth. Mm. Also, if you look at the drugs that are being purchased by the NHS, pharmaceutical companies that are charging extraordinary amounts for things like basic pain relievers, mm. right? That you could actually buy at a local supermarket cheaper, but they are being sold at astronomical cost. Buy them cost. on the corner outside the supermarket cheaper as well, if you're, you're less picky about the sort of medical purity of the drugs. But the problem is, is that they, they can only buy two packets at a time, right? So yeah. they'd have to have the whole hospital queuing up to restock, <laughs> wouldn't they? <laughs> Just putting through each transaction. And... Um, that I would say is by stealth, yeah. and that this is this kind of lends itself to what Labour are talking about with na renationalising the rail. It doesn't work renationalising if, under the umbrella of government public ownership, you have private entities operating, which the NHS has at the moment, as will the rail with Labour's plan, mm. because they're going to have private companies operating. By the way, on a monopoly, because. I don't know about you, but if you try to go to somewhere like Liverpool, you can only take one, maybe two operators. Mm. That's it. Yep. When you have those private entities under a national umbrella, it costs ex exorbitantly more. Well, this is the thing as well. But at this point now, um, the fees for the agency staff would have covered the pay rise that the junior doctors were asking for. Stop pointing out obvious things. <laughs> Um, imagine, if, imagine if someone from Labour actually grasped the nettle off that line yeah. and said it. Well, he was, he said the opposite this morning, didn't he? I mean, what, what did he say? I'm sorry, I'm not going to make you a false promise. You're not getting that pay rise. Yeah. It is great to see the political leaders of the Labour movement advocating on behalf of the work, working, pe working people. Yeah. Is that what? Because I would, I would have said. He's doing it by stealth. I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a grandpa. You don't. I'm just, guys, I'm just saying it. Yeah. Promise you. Uh, it's extraordinary. <laughs> it's absolutely extraordinary that Rishi Sunak bemoans the fact that half a million people, an extra half a million people are on the NHS waiting list because of strike action. And it's like, yes, Rishi, do you know how you could have avoided the strike action by negotiating with them? It was much better, Ollie, to get in agency workers who charge yes. three times the yes. amount. So it's galaxy brain stuff. And, and by the way, the restitution of pay to their level in 2008 uh, in, in real terms. It's not a pay rise, it's a restitution. But... There we are. There we are. I, I mean, are you feeling fucking invigorated at the prospect of a Labour government, Ava Santina? Because I am. I can, I can feel, I can feel Tony Blair inside me. Oh. Oh. Not like that. I'm more of a Gordon Brown woman myself. I don't know what it feels like. No? No. Well, I mean, neither do I. I've only felt the ghost of Blair. I've only felt the ghost of Blair. <laughs> I'm so upset. He's buxom. There's a really, really good Treasury documentary of Gordon Brown. Oh, yeah. And Ed Balls and Ed Miliband are his staffers. Yeah. It's one of the best documentaries you'll ever see. Where Have is it? Have you watched it? No. On YouTube. I'm... I actually think that we do a watch along of the, that. This is like when, Laura, who was it? Um, uh, Mag Magugan, who was talking about the infected blood scandal and told us about the, the prison rodeo. Yeah, in the Louisiana State Penitentiary. And immediately afterwards, I went and watched the video of like prisoners fucking bull riding and shit. But I can't go. There's a general election on Ava. I can't leave here and sit at the desk and be like, oh, I'm just going to watch fucking buckle up, boys. Ah, Brown, balls, Miller band. Let's go. One hour documentary. I think we do that as a watch along. It's so good. But, yeah, but in the pantheon of Robbie Williams at Nebworth. Yeah. June 2. Yeah. Brown documentaries at least third. This is good actually because now we've got one each that we want. So now we could get people to vote on it. Which of those do I want? June. Obviously you want June. Because if you don't want I June, want you to watch June in your own time. I, I've already Not on the company's dime. I've already explained to you that I will not work for you for free. <laughs> <laughs> I will get no enjoyment out of watching June too. I the, actually the discourse has turned on Zendaya now by the way why uh, is it because she keeps wearing that um, Christian Louboutin the So Kate because I hate that shoe as well it's not because of that no yeah. people have decided that her performance is wooden in June too do you think it was wooden <laughs> 
I don't think it's not about her. Oh, it's not. It's it's about it's about cults of personality and jihad. You don't think she's jihad? She's anti jihad, if anything. Oh, is that why? Yeah, fully. Right. I, I appreciate you haven't seen the film. She's like the she's like the fucking know it all. Who's like this is going to end badly? It's like yeah, we know it's going to end badly. Holy war! Mm. People really liked your jihadist nimbys line yesterday. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Maybe we should put that on a t-shirt. I actually got that. I I I, I, well, I didn't see, but I'm glad there was also public mm. outpouring. I got a lot of personal. Did you? Yeah. I got a lot of people just kept sending me jihadist nimbies and I'm like I'm really glad that I'm not like going through an airport right now <laughs> <laughs> you get pulled for a TSA uh, fucking yeah. interview and they like hand over your phone you're like oh no and I'm like explaining to no, so basically what it is they it's the green like... party in Bristol Central <laughs> they don't want to build they think nimby is like a fucking acronym for a terror group yeah Northern Irish my backyard did you hear that he just goes straight for the Northern Irish well NI right it's not gonna be national insurance is it it might be be the lamest fucking terror group you've ever seen Northern Irish mums what do we want a 2% reduction in national insurance battling what could the Y be Northern Irish mums yeah Northern yeah did you see that video that went around WhatsApp several videos that went around WhatsApp and Facebook from I'm going to call them Nor Northern Irish mums at a Hendu. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah? <laughs> it was fucking wild. Where is it? Is this something we do after you the podcast? Couldn't, yeah, or I wouldn't recommend Googling we... it right now. Okay. NSFW. Oh, yeah. Because everything else we talk about here is very it's safe. PG, it's PG-13 on this yeah. pod. Yeah. We haven't even got to Mickey Mouse degrees yet. Couldn't name one, could he? Damien Hines. I'll, I'll fucking tell him one right now. Classics. Want to read? Want to read ancient Greek? Get a fucking job. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you on that. Classics. Because there actually are Mickey Mouse degrees. PPE. No, because the economics might be quite important. <laughs> Bollocks. And the philosophy. Bollocks. Because when you destroy the working classes, you want under you want to understand why. <laughs> you know. And also, I think I could imagine it's sort of like, do you know when crushing crushing an ant? Yeah. Oh yeah. When you're like, oh, but it's not really got a nervous system, so it doesn't really feel that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure an ant has a nervous system. Okay, take it back. Let me just redo that then. Jellyfish. Okay, actually, it works if it does have a nervous system. When you're crushing an ant, <laughs> right? Yeah, back and on you track. relish in the joy of the pain that it's feeling. <laughs> this is what the conservatives who have studied PPE can do mm. with the working classes. Yeah. They could go, squeeze the man, and I know that he feels the pain. That, and that's the philosophy element. Yeah. Nice. What else do you think is a Mickey Mouse degree? Because they'll say, like, media studies. Which is total bollocks, because that is actually quite worthwhile. Gender studies? No, but you know media studies. I'm not being funny. Do you know how many of these people, not the media <laughs> studies graduates, because they can, mm. the people who call it a Mickey Mouse degree, can't print a PDF? <laughs> like. The, the funny thing is we can't print PDFs right now. Yeah, but that's because we haven't got a fucking printer. <laughs> yeah, there's two degrees between us right here, over Centine, and we can't get a fucking printer to work. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So Mickey Mouse degree politics. Or but you know when they English like, literature, Mickey Mouse. English literature, Mickey Mouse. Yeah, probably. As an English basically, literature graduate. <laughs> basically, I'm getting at what degree isn't like if you actually boil it down. <clears throat> to, unless you're studying something that is vocational, like medicine, law, engineering, dentistry. What good is my humanities subject? What does it do? What does it do? Well, I guess it taught you to critical think. It's very dangerous, that isn't it? Why are you laughing? Because I think the way the proper syntax of that sentence would be, it taught you to think critically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. English literature degree. Yeah, but I did have about seven beers last night as well. Strong. Yeah. Very no, strong. I, actually, I mean, I actually feel fine. That's water off a duck's back, isn't it? Seven beers. It is. That's what worries me. It's light work. It's yeah. breakfast. I, I could cycle home. I didn't for the purpose of You absolutely of the would not have cycled home on seven beers. No, I didn't. That much. You would never do such a thing. No. Oh, I think 
Laura, did you put did you put some Mickey Mouse degrees on there? Yeah. You ready, oh, ready for is this? Is this Laura's opinion? Yeah. Laura Beverages, yeah. Mickey Mouse degrees, <laughs> list. Item one. A master's degree in magic and occult science. What's your beef with that, Laura? <laughs> <laughs> Robin Hood studies. What does that mean? Like wealth redistribution. <laughs> Theft. Ah. It teaches you brigandry <laughs> and how to fletch an arrow. Right, okay. What's on next on Laura's list? Brewing and distilling. That feels pretty important if you're going to go into brewing and distilling. It sounds distilling. pretty important to you, Mrs. Seven Beers, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but if you were going to go into brewing and distilling. Bro. Yeah? Bro. It's a podcasting degree. I tell you what, I think regular listeners will think, actually, you lot should fucking go back to school. Yeah. What did Ed do at City? Not that. Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, psychedelics. What do you think you do? It? Well, because presumably, if you're going to go into to work in with with drugs or into drug reform, you might want to do that. Yeah, but interestingly, it's not an MSc. It's not a Master of Science. It's a Master of the Arts. Well. <laughs> subjective isn't it yeah <laughs> everything's subjective when you're fucking on a hero's dose of mushrooms critical think and finally <laughs> this this isn't real tournament golf all right laura we'll give you that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah tournament golf at cornwall college yeah what do they teach you like the rules of golf tournament i don't is it how to put on a tournament? But it's an undergrad, so is it a three-year course in tournament <laughs> golf? <laughs> What's caught? What, yeah, okay. I wouldn't mind doing that, you know. Look, um, I mean, they sound fun. They sound fun, is what I would say. What's sad is that she's actually specifically put in the brief that she doesn't think this. Uh, yeah. Really covering her tracks there, isn't she? Tournament golf. Tournament golf degree? BSc. I've got it. It's a Bachelor of Science. What the fuck? <laughs> Are you ready to take your game to the next level? Amen, brother. Be careful how you respond. It's because we'll hold you to it. Ooh. This is a bit... A bit flirty. Yeah, this is a bit... Fucking... Cornwall College, get off me. That, isn't it? Fucking Jesus. hell. Gosh, At least buy that. me dinner first, Cornwall College. So it's like College. kink golf. What golf? Kink. Oh. Golf. Sorry, sorry. Is my syntax upsetting you there as well? <laughs> no, I just hadn't heard. Golf of... with kink. <laughs> I hadn't. <laughs> I wasn't familiar with golf kink. I suppose there are 18 holes. <laughs> right. What's your favourite club? Of what? Golf. What do you mean? Like, team? Oh, the sticks. <laughs> Someone needs to go to golf school. Yeah, sorry. I this is day one stuff, Ava. Are you a golfer? No. All right. Well, what's your favourite club? I like a wedge. A wedge, yeah? Yeah. I like the short game. Is that that big chunky one? No. That's a driver. It feels like they should have called that one the wedge. <sighs> The driver feels like it should be one of those more thin ones. Those are the irons. The irons. Mm. Okay. Well, that's day one of the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother. Don't bother with the degree. We've got it covered. Yeah. Tomorrow we do balls. Right. Enough? Yeah, that's enough. Well, do you want to wrap it up? I was thinking, yeah, would I just leave a pregnant pause or will I? I don't know. Leave a review. Additional programme costs of ten and a half thousand pounds to cover the costs yeah. of unlimited golf. <laughs> <laughs> golf, no limits. This is amazing. Push it to the limit. It's just like a fifty-year-old man with gout putting endlessly. Unlimited Sounds golf. Sounds like purgatory. Um. See you in the subreddit. No way, we can't. We can't end yet. <laughs> year one golf training. Year two golf psychology. <laughs> year 
year three interdisciplinary approach nice <laughs> and applied golf psychology i do believe it's a very mental game is it like darts yeah You've got to have 80 UCAS points to do this. What's that? What's that in layman's terms? I'm not What's sure. What's that in old money? I'm not is sure. Is that an A level? Is that two A levels? Well, you need GCSEs at grade C or if above. If Cleo was here, she'd be able to tell us. Yeah, she would, wouldn't she? You need, you need GCSEs at grade C or above in English and maths. All right, we can end now. Sorry about that. Look, get your applications in because these fucking, these Tories... Degrees like that aren't long of this world. Mm. I tell you what, if any of our listeners know someone who's done the golf course, I would fucking, I'd love to hear from you. Love to hear from you. Yeah. Or even the college. It's not outside the realms yeah. of possibility. If you're at Cornwall College, get in touch. If you're, if you're at Cornwall College, leave a review. Five stars, preferably. Although I doubt that after we've just... Mocked, mocked there. Well, we didn't mock it. It was Laura curriculum. who yeah, said it was right. a it was Mickey Laura Mouse who degree. It, yeah. Okay, well, we better crack on with the day. We probably should, yeah. It's, it's well past. Well past election time, isn't it? Mm. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>